Hmm? Oh. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. And if you're in your neighborhood, come on by. Join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are continuing our study in the book of 2 Corinthians, and we will be in chapter 5. So if you want to grab your Bibles, your cup of coffee, a highlighter, a pencil, pen, whatever, and we're going to get into God's Word. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come before you, Lord, and we ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning. Father, as we read your words, just as they did in the book of Nehemiah, from morning until evening, Lord, and the Bible says they were paying attention the whole time. May we, Lord, pay attention to your words that are being read and expounded upon, that we may find some application for our lives and be prosperous, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Good morning, Diana. Good morning, Patty. Glad you guys could join us. Let's start with verse 1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house, that is this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So Paul assures the Corinthian believers that these bodies that we have now are like tents. And I don't know if you know anything about tents. They're temporal. They're not made to last. You can only stay in them for so long because the weather will deteriorate them. The winds will come and blow them away. And so like these bodies, they don't last very long. <laughs> the older I get, I realize how that is so true because things start to break down, the wind comes and you topple over. And so they're not designed to last forever, but God has a body for us in heaven prepared by him that will be eternal. That's our hope. That is our hope, guys. That, that is the gospel right there. That is something that we should be excited about and should be good news in our lives that we should be sharing it with so many others. And it's eternal and it's in heaven waiting for us. I don't know why so many people want to live on this earth for a long time. I hear that all, all the time. I, I just want, I want to extend my life. I want to be healthy. I want to take pills. I want to do this. I want to do that so that my life can be extended. Uh, we're made for heaven. We're not made for earth. If anything, we are to preach the gospel where we're here because we're here only a short time. So he goes on, for in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our new habitation, which is from heaven. So we literally groan. It sounds like Paul's quote in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, when he talks about the earth groaning to put on a new earth. And so our bodies are constantly groaning. How does it groan? Well, with aches and pains. You know, as I said earlier, you know, your knees start to hurt. And knees, knees oftentimes hurt because you have, you have ligaments that connect your, your lower leg to your upper leg. And then in between those ligaments, you have what you call uh, fibers, meniscus, which uh, pad or cushion the bones that are rubbing on each other. And after time, that meniscus in the center there, it wears out. It gets thin. And as you get older, it's thinner and thinner. And all of a sudden, you either get... Uh, uh, bursitis or you get uh, uh, arthritis or you get bone to bone uh, rubbing which then causes inflammation in the joints water and so forth and you have an issue but that happens in time when you're younger everything's nice and and new and, and there's no issues you can jump I remember jumping from my roof in my home when I was a young kid in Roland Heights I literally jumped from the roof to the ground and for me to even think about attempting that today would be ridiculous <laughs> I would be insane to even think about jumping like that. But that's what happens as we get older. And when you put more weight upon those knee joints, it hurts even more. So a lot of us complain about the knees, and a lot of times it's weight, and a lot of times it's age, and it's just you know wear, or it's arthritis or bursitis, which is, gets into the sacs of the joints, and it just causes a lot of issues. And so you have knee replacements, uh, you have knee surgery, and you have needles stuck in to pull out fluids and stuff. So tell me that's not the body saying, I need a new body. 
You know, I need a new body. And so our bodies are groaning, is what he's saying here, to put on a new habitation, a new dwelling. If indeed, verse 3, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And so it's not that we want these bodies to last. We want a whole new body, and we want it to be eternal. And it will be, and that is our hope. Now, he goes on. Now, I'm saying this because he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So how do we know that this is true, the resurrected body? Because God has prepared it. And how do we know that God has prepared it? Because he's given us a guarantee. What is that guarantee? That guarantee is, is like a down payment. In, in the old days, and some of you might know this, uh, you could actually lay away clothing or items. You go to the store and you say, I like that item. And I would love to purchase that item, but I don't have the money right now. So could you put it away and I'll put a deposit on it so you hold it for me. That's a, a little layaway plan. And then you would pay for it. And then when you're done paying for it, it would be yours. Well, God has given us a deposit in a sense. He has put us on layaway. And that deposit is the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Therefore, we are always confident, <clears throat> knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So and that's a truth. We're not with the Lord right now. None of us have really met the Lord. Maybe there's been a few. I don't, I don't doubt that God has not revealed himself to some. <clears throat> I hear in some of the third world countries where there's Muslims, that Muslims are coming to the Lord because they're seeing visions of Jesus. He may be coming to them and, and causing revival among them. <clears throat> and they're coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I don't doubt that, but generally speaking, none of us have really seen the Lord at all. We're absent from him at this point. We won't see him until we're in heaven. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, this is a scripture that's quoted a lot. We walk by faith and not by sight. Just because we haven't seen the Lord does not mean that he does not exist. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but have you ever seen wind? Have you seen wind at all? Does not mean it doesn't exist. There's days in Mariloma where you don't see wind at all. It's calm, those trees aren't moving. And you could be walking out there and all of a sudden the wind picks up and whoo, you never saw it coming, but it came. And how do we know that the, the wind came? By the results. We see the trees, we see the leaves, we see tumbleweeds flying all over the place. Trucks will topple over, you know, because it's strong enough. And so we see the results of the wind, though we don't see wind. There's a lot of things we don't see. <clears throat> and we have to believe it by faith. We don't see the insides of our bodies necessarily. We can if we want to go to the doctors. Um, I've never seen my heart personally, but I know I have a heart and it beats because I feel it and I see it in my body and it works. And I know by faith it's going to continue on. Um, it's not something I do. So as Christians, uh, our hope in the resurrection and a new body is by faith and not by sight. We see people dying, but we don't see them going to heaven. But we know the Gospels tells us that absent from the body is present with the Lord. So we believe that by faith because the Bible says so. And the Bible has given us enough evidence to prove that it's true in the prophecies themselves concerning Jesus. It's amazing when you read all the prophecies of the Bible and how they have come true 100%. So <clears throat> you see that happening. You have faith and you trust God, but it's not by sight. We are not Christians that are moved by emotions and by feelings, and we need to get rid of those emotions and feelings. I know it, I know that it doesn't sound you know, uh, logical because you think, no, but we're, we're, we're made to feel, and we are. And feelings come into play in certain instances. But when it comes to the scriptures, we have to believe the scriptures above our feelings. If our feelings are telling us one thing, then we have to believe what the scriptures, if the scriptures are telling us something different. And so he says, as believers, we walk by faith. We trust in God. We believe in his word. And so we cling to that, and we don't walk by sight at all. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. <clears throat> Paul's excited. 
I'm confident that if I leave this body, I will be in the presence of God. Again, and I know I've said this before because I know people who have lost loved ones. Uh, we lost uh, our brother-in-law. He was <clears throat> about 30 years old, had stomach cancer. <clears throat> and uh, his mother, you know, deeply loved him, had a sister, had, had um, you know, brothers and sisters and so forth. And the mother was just so devastated from that that she would go to the grave almost every day, every day, every day. And then finally, thank God, finally thank God that she realized that he's gone, that he's in heaven, and that she'll see him one day, and that she had another child that she needed to take care of. That happens oftentimes too, where, where mothers would neglect their other children because one has died. See, if we have true hope, if we have true hope, and I'm not questioning you whether you believe in God, I'm questioning whether your faith is strong. And it may not be strong, so you have to ask God for strength and for him to strengthen it. And then you have to walk by faith and not by sight. You can see that your relatives are not here, your loved ones are not here, but the fact is they're in heaven and they're rejoicing and they're putting on a new body. And Paul says that, I'm confident, I'm well pleased. You know, rather be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And this young man is in heaven. I remember when they said they couldn't do anything about it. And here's, here's a sight thing. <clears throat> he said uh, they decided to take him home in hospice. And when he was passing away, he told his wife, he said, I'll see you when you get to heaven. Amen. And as he was passing, she said that she looked at his arm, his forearm here, and a cross all of a sudden appeared. And as he died, it disappeared. Wow. So... A little evidence that you know God was saying that he's in heaven so we have to have the faith and if you don't have faith and you're down in your morning you're you're complaining and you're not moving forward then it's because you're not having faith in God and what he has said and so you need to pray for the faith that God would give it to you it doesn't mean God doesn't love you it doesn't mean that you're a doubter it just means you're struggling with that area and it's an area that you need to to pursue and to find victory and, and joy in the fact that they're with the Lord. Now he goes on, Therefore we make our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. So whether we're there or not, we're going to please him. And that's really the key. Are you pleasing God? How is, your life, how is your life right now? Are you living for him? Are you serving in a church? Are you involved? That's how you please God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. If you're not doing anything, you're not going to have anything to judge. And God is not going to reward you because you got nothing. All you're doing is doing your own thing. The problem is, is that we think we're God's, and we don't need to serve. We don't need to serve God. We make up our own rules and our own regulations and what we want to do, but the fact is that we're not our own. I read Paul Tripp's uh, little message today, and it was pretty good. And it, it was basically on that subject. And he starts it off with, uh, we are not in charge of our lives. We are not, and he just went on and listed everything that we think we're in charge of doing. We are not in charge of our destiny. We're not in control. We're not to do what we want to do. We're not to, and he went on and on. And at the end, he said, we are Christ. And we are to do what Christ has asked us to do because he bought us and we are not our own. But too many people think that they're their owns <clears throat> and thus they become their God. So absent from the body, whether good or not, you'll be judged. Knowing therefore the terror or the wrath of God or of the Lord, we persuade men uh, the word persuade there is interesting because you're trying to convince men the truth of the gospel message. And, and you're almost trying to debate with them, to make them and help them see that. But the Holy Spirit's the only one that can help them see that. So he's saying, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to glory on our behalf, that you may have something to answer those who glory in appearance and not in heart. For if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. 
and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died, for whom, for them, and rose again. Now, let me read that again, just so you you hear what I said earlier, that we're not our own, that it, we're Christ, and we're to be obedient children to the word. And, and that's an analogy there, isn't it? When you have a child, does that child do what the child wants to do? They attempt to, right? You know, they'll look at you, Mom, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. Can I just go do this? Can I run around? I remember uh, one time we were in the mall years ago when Simon was young. We were buying clothes. And the kids were just running around all over the place. And I kept telling them, stop it. Stay over here. You stay next to us. And Simon kept running. And all of a sudden, we lost him. We lost him. He was doing what he wanted to do. And he went out and he got lost. And we're looking for him, calling for him, and it took probably a good five minutes. And the whole time, he was being a little brat. He was in between the clothes racks, hiding and sitting there and laughing. See, that's the nature of humanity. We want to do our own thing. We think it's funny, and we think it's without you know, any um, repercussions. Uh, we are like that in adults. We see it in our children. And we love our children because we're parents. We don't tell them, do whatever you want. And they're running out in the streets. They're climbing up trees. They're jumping on houses. They're playing with matches. They're doing, do whatever you want. We don't care. You're your own person. You'll make your, I, I hate that. Personally, when an adult says, I'm going to let my child make their own decision. Mm -hmm. You got to be kidding me. Yeah. A child make, the, make your, his own decision. No, Train up a child in the way he should go, the Bible says. Then when he is older, he shall not depart. When he is older, when he becomes an adult, then he makes his decision. But as a child, you are responsible for that child. You will make those decisions for that child. But parents don't think that way. I'll tell you what, and I'm, I'm going to say it right up front. The reason that our, this generation, these young kids are the way they are, without authority, they have no respect, they're doing what they want, is because of the last generations that kept saying, let, us make, let them make their own decisions, let them rule their own lives. We shouldn't interfere in what they... And this is why our society is the way it is. Amen. Because there's no structure, there's no rules, there's no guidance, there's no morality. And the parents are at fault for that. I am one that trained up my child in the way of the Lord. And the reason that they're still serving the Lord today is because of that. And they made their decisions. Oh, they have tried to walk away, but God has brought them back. And now they have the responsibility to train up their children. So Paul was very adamant right here concerning that truth that uh, Christ <clears throat> died for all of us. That's the gospel. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, verse 16, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, what does it say? He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. This is what you call born again. That's what that means. That means born of the mind, born of the heart, born of the body. You're a born again believer. That means that you hunger for the word of God. You can't get enough of the word of God. That means you believe the word of God because you're born again. You're not doubting. You know you don't doubt as a Christian? You don't doubt. We call it doubting, but you don't. What you're doing is, is you're trying to figure out and understand things so that you can have the faith to believe it. But we are not to doubt, and true Christians don't doubt. True Christians don't question the Bible. Now, I say question the Bible in the sense that it's wrong. We question it to find out what is right and what it's saying. That's Amen. what we do. We inspect it. We examine it. We study it. We think about it. We meditate upon it and so forth. But we don't question its validity. Why? Because we're born again. Born again children don't do that. When you're born into a family... <clears throat> You're born in that family. Sometimes you question, am I really a part of this family? It's pretty strange. <laughs> but you know you're a part of that family. You just question it because of what they do. And you don't like what they do. But you know you're a part of that family. And so you're born again. Let me read that again because it's so clear. And it's something that you have to understand and accept and believe by faith and not by a sight. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone says they're a Christian, if anyone claims to know God, if anyone knows Jesus Christ, he is a new creation. That means he's not the old man. He's not doing the old things. He's something totally different, something totally new. In fact, if somebody knew you in the past and met you now, they would say, who are you? You are not the person I knew in the past. 
He says, old things have passed away. That means all your old life, all your old sins, all the things that you used to do, all the things you used to like are no longer a part of your life. They passed away. Behold, all things become new. They all become new. All become new. Everything is new. Everything is an experience. Everything is like you've done it for the first time again with Christ. Then he goes on, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Who has the ministry of reconciliation? Paul says we do. What is reconciliation? Well, you ever have uh, people fighting or looking to get a divorce and they say they, they get reconciled, they make up, they repent, they forgive one another and then they continue to live together as married couples. That's reconciliation. We have the many of reconciliation in that we are trying to reconcile the unsaved world with Christ or people who come to church that say they're Christians and yet their, their walk is very shady. We are constantly teaching and discipling them to reconcile them to Christ, getting them right with the Lord in a right relationship. And it even says here in verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were what? Pleading, Pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to Christ. Uh, I used to have a ministry when I was young in the Lord, about 20 <clears throat> seven or eight, and we called it Pleaders for Christ. And it was an evangelistic ministry. We were evangelists, and we would go out every week to the Riverside uh, Greyhound bus station, and we would be pleading with people for Christ. Met some very interesting people there. We would go to movie theaters, and we would stand out in the theaters, and we would have tracks, and we would plead with people to come to know Christ. We would go to stores, uh, we'd go to malls, and we'd stand out there and plead with people to Christ. My son one time went to the Pomona Fairgrounds, that whole you know, uh, yearly fairground that goes along, and he, in the middle of the crowd, just started preaching the gospel. And he started asking questions, and a whole crowd was around him. He was pleading for Christ. That's what we did. Why did we do that? Because we were new creatures in Christ Jesus. We don't see that today. We don't see someone get saved and go, wow, I'm saved and I want to share the gospel and they're now out preaching that gospel. Why don't they do that? Because they're not born again. They're not new creatures. They're still struggling. They, they really need to accept Christ into their heart and then start seeking him for a filling of the Holy Spirit, a moving in their lives to glorify him. But we're not seeing that anymore. It seems like the spirit has been quenched in our society lately. And I believe it might get worse until a revival comes. But I also believe that it's up to every individual Amen. that they would become pleaders for Christ. So if anything, if you're asking, what does God want of me? He wants you to share the gospel. He wants you to be pleading for Christ. I'd like to bring back that ministry here one day, if, I, if the Lord raises up somebody that just has a heart to evangelize, to name it Pleaders for Christ. Pleaders for Christ. I, I love that word. Uh, we met an old lady one time out there at Riverside bus station, and we we're pleading with her, you know, hey, do you, do you know Jesus Christ? And she goes, oh, yeah, I know Jesus. I go, you know, the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. She goes, oh, no, I've never sinned. <laughs> and so we stopped. I says, you have never told a lie? And she goes, nope, I've never told a lie. You mean you have never fibbed on the IRS form? Nope, I've never fibbed. Have you ever stolen? Nope, I've never stolen anything. And she, de she was adamant about never sinning at all. But by nature, the Bible says you are sinners. And we just couldn't get through to her that she was a sinner in need of Christ. Uh, we've met people there that were prostitutes on both sides, male and female. And we preached the gospel with them. We were threatened there. Somebody, somebody had a gun, and they had it in their sweatshirt pocket, and they were listening to us the whole time, and then they grabbed the gun, pointed it at us, and they said, do you really believe what you're preaching? Because I'll kill you right now. And me and the guy that were together preaching, we both looked at each other, and we said, before you shoot us, we just need to tell you something. Christ loves you, and you need to repent from your sins and believe in him to have eternal life. 
you know, and we kept preaching and preaching with him, and finally he put it back in there, and he kept listening, and then we were able to help him. We called his mother. He was living on the streets. Reunite him and his mother together. So we've seen all that stuff, the moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives because we were pleaders for Christ. Then he closes, for he made him who knew no sin, that's speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel right there. Amen. Jesus knew no sin. He became sin on our behalf. He took on our sin, so we took on his righteousness. It was a swap in a sense, right? We swapped. Here, Jesus, here's our wretched, sinful, narcissistic, self-centeredness. You take that, and Jesus, here you go. You take my holiness, purity, and righteousness so that my Father will receive you into heaven. Is that a good trade? <laughs> for us, it's a good deal. Was it a good deal for Christ? No and yes, because he loved it. He did it because he loved us. And so for him, he felt it was a great deal because he did something new. That's how much Christ loves us. Amen. God is good. I wish, I wish I could expound on those things there because that's an awesome chapter there. One that... Um, one that should move us all, and we should probably read that over several times, if not at least a hundred times. Take take some time and just read that chapter over, especially that latter part where he says you're a new creature and to the yeah. end there and see what Christ has done. And then prayerfully go before the Lord and say, Lord, would you help me be a pleader for Christ? Would you help me to be a new creation, Lord? Would you help me to change my life and, and not stop praying to the Lord until he does it? Let him know, I'm serious about this. I really want this, Lord. And, and I'm not stopping until you touch the hip and cripple me with being a pleader for Christ, Lord. And I think that we'll see revival happen if that Amen. takes place in our lives. So God bless you guys. Thank you for viewing Devo 30 with us. Please, 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 I, I say this with all my heart and for the gospel's sake. Share this on your Facebook. Others need to hear this. If you're not a pleader out in the streets, you can be a pleader on Facebook by just sharing it on your, on your page there. So what? So what if people look at it? So what if they call you Christians? That's exactly what they did to Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You're either for Christ or you're against Christ. Share this on your wall. Maybe someone will get saved. God bless you. We love you. If you have any prayer requests, please post them and we will pray for you or private message me. God bless.